Well, good morning, and I do greet you again as I, we have gathered here together at uh, the First Augusta Primitive Baptist Church. I'm thankful to be here, uh, and I look forward to the next time that I'll be here, but there's a number of places I'm going to be between now and then. Uh, I think I've already told the uh, YouTube congregation where we are, were, and that was the point that I wanted to make, that... Uh, that we are here at the First Augusta Primitive Baptist Church. And thank you for being here. I want to ask you to turn your attention this morning to an Old Testament book, the, the, uh, the first book of Samuel, or 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 10 through 15. We're going to be reading there and you know, it's one of those passages that I was aware of, but until it was brought to my attention, I just hadn't paid it a whole lot of attention, but it, it kind of drew me, it made me think. And uh, say, wow, this was David? This was the anointed of the Lord who's done this? And we haven't, he hasn't even been, a, or, or, he's been, anointed, but he has not taken over the kingship yet. He's still David the shepherd. He's uh, been brought into the, the court of Saul, of Saul, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. 1 Samuel chapter 21, reading verses 10 through 15. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and went to Ashish, the king of Gath. That's among the Philistines. And the servants of Ahish said unto him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing one, sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David laid up those words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Ahish, the king of Gath, and he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the walls of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Ahish unto his servants, Lo, ye see this man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Shall this fellow come into my house? Ahish, king of the Philistines, asked. Will you pray with me? Lord God, our Father, which art in heaven, it is indeed a pleasure to come into your house this morning. Father, I thank thee for those who have come to worship you and pray, O oh Lord, that our worship might be accepted by thy holy presence. Guide and direct us, Lord, or guide and direct me as I speak this morning, that it be all to the glory and the praise of you and to the uh, honor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I thank you for the prayer that's already been gone up and uh, here as we gathered and for those which have gone up prior to our meeting together. Now, Father, I ask your blessings upon the words that I say that we might see Jesus in them. And it's in that precious and holy name I do ask it. And amen. Now, in this passage, we see David, again, the anointed of the Lord. And he is possibly at the very lowest point of his life until his sin with Bathsheba. He's on the king, or excuse me, he's on the run from King Saul, and he's gone to this Philistine king, Ahish, or Abimelech, as many as the uh, Philistine, Philistine kings were called. Now, if you'll note, uh, Abimelech, A-B-E-M, is so, so, sort of like Pharaoh for the Philistines. Each Pharaoh had a name, but they were addressed as Pharaoh. 
And if you are familiar with your history back with Abraham, you'll note that he dealt with an Abimelech. And then Isaac dwelt with another Abimelech. So each king of the Philistine cities had it, were called Abimelech. But let's go back to David. David arrives there in Gath. And he realizes that he may not be as welcomed with opened arms as he initially thought. You know, he had a history uh, with the uh, Philistines. His first contact, he killed Goliath, their hero. And then he has defeated them in other battles. And only as when he left Saul's house, he went by Nob. And I can't tell you exactly where that is. But there, the priest gave him, Ahimelech, the priest gave him Goliath's sword because he didn't have any arms. So he gets to Gath, to the uh, Abimelech. That's the easiest one for me to remember. And he realizes, hey, these people aren't fools. They know me. I had better do something so that they don't kill me. So he had possibly arrived there with Goliath's sword. But I imagine that as he, before he got there, he hid that sword because he didn't want it taken back by the uh, Philistines. So as he realizes that he may not have a real friendly, friendly reception, David stoops to acting the fool in the king's court. He began acting as if he were a madman. How did, how did it phrase it? Uh, he scrabbled on the doors of the gates and let his spittle fall down upon his chin, beard. And Abimelech, I don't know if he was fooled or not, but he says, I don't want this man in my house. Send him away. So what do we have here? Here we find the future king of Israel. We find him alone. He's thrown away even his own his self-respect as he's hit rock bottom. There's no lower place that he can go. But now, what brought it, brought this about? What brought David to this lowest point in his life? Well, for one thing, David's lost the support system upon which he was leaning since he came into the uh, court of Saul. Now, y'all think about it. Just like David, each of us have a support system. We have people and things that we depend upon day by day and even though we may not want to admit it, we are probably guilty that at times we are leaning more upon that support system than we are the Lord God Almighty. And that is who we are to be leaning on. That is who our support is. Not just us here, but all of God's people should be leaning on His fur, Him first. And I'll guarantee you, that if we don't lean on the Lord, He will, in His own way and in His own time, show us the error of our way and cause us to learn or relearn, in my case, that I should be leaning on Him first. So what I want to do is, I want to go back to David's rise to prominence. He first came to Saul's eyes as he killed Goliath. So Goliath, uh, David is going to be brought into the king's court. Now I want you to remember Goliath, uh, David, I'll keep my character straight in a minute. David at this point in time is a very young man. 
And I would imagine that this is the first time that he has been away from home and family. Those are very important places. And as far as we know, David has always been a model of faith and devotion to God. But where is he now? He is in a new environment. There's a lot of splendor there that to overwhelm him. And he has or he needs some stability. He needs someone to lean on. Home and family are back in Bethlehem. And God, by his grace, provided people and things to give him support in this new environment. Now, David has killed Goliath. He has been brought into the king's court. He's been made a captain over a thousand in Saul's army. He's also been made the chief musician in the, in the court. And these, were, they, these positions, the, uh, the work of these offices, gave him some of the stability that he needed. We see that he has become very popular among the people. As we read, they, they, they greeted him singing, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And I understand that it's, he conducted himself wisely when he mingled among the people. And David began to lean on the support of the people. Now there are some, spe there are some special people who came into David's life. His wife, Michelle, I think I'm saying that correctly, Saul's daughter, who truly loved him and, and who supported him. Then there was Jonathan. This was Saul's son. He became a very faithful friend to David, to this newcomer in the court of his father. And we know that eventually Jonathan became David's eyes and ears in the court when he was absent. We know that Jonathan's support of David was high, heavily relied on when David started to fall out of favor with Saul. And then we find the prophet Samuel. This is a God's servant who had anointed David to be king of Israel, who we believe taught him about service and personal sacrifices and worship. And we'll see that he fled to uh, Samuel, when he left Saul's court. We also find that David carried himself wisely. He, he put great emphasis on doing the right thing. He put great emphasis on carrying himself well before men. He also had self-respect self-control and self-esteem, which we might call pride. And this may have been the cause of his downfall. Now let's step away from David a moment again. Look at ourselves. Look at our own support systems. And I'm going to reference myself instead of asking some of y'all to, to, to talk about yours. And don't tell her I've said this. But I'm going to ask, where would I be without the love and support of Susan? I'd be lost, folks. Where would I be without the support of my friends back there in Statesboro? Where would I be without the fellowship and the friendship and the love and the encouragement of my home church and of the churches that I'm blessed to be able to preach at. Where would I be without the Bible to guide me as I seek to be obedient to the will of God? Where would I be had he not given me the grace to follow him? Where would I be without these supports that God has provided? Selah. Y'all know what? Selah. Think about that yourselves. Now let's go back to David. In previous chapters, we, 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 we've watched these supports 
being gradually pulled out from under David as God allowed him uh, these sports to be pulled out. David was at the top of the world. And now he's fallen to the bottom. David, well, it was so bad that David said of himself, there is but a step between me and death. It wouldn't take but one, one thing and he would have died. He realized that he had lost the support system that he had had in place, the support system that he had been relying on. God had begun to remove the very props of the earth that David was relying on. So what has happened? David lost his position. He went from being one of the greatest battlefield heroes of Israel and being a captain over a thousand in Israel's army to being a fugitive. He's a fugitive. And once he became a fugitive, he lost all of his popularity. The people no longer cheered him as he came into town because he couldn't come into town. He was public enemy number one as far as Saul was concerned. He was no longer in the public's eye. And you know how people's memories are when you don't see them every day. Public's memory. Hey, oh, I remember him. He did so and so back then. I wonder what he's up to today. And as a fugitive, David loses those special people that he had started to lean on or that he had been leaning on. His wife had to send David away. And she eventually turned away from him and married another. And then later, after he became king, they were reunited. And then she began to despise David. But when David left his wife, he fled to Ramah. This is where the prophet Samuel was. But if we look in chapter 20, in verse 1, David has to leave Ramah because Saul has discovered where he's at. And he's sending men after him there. And then later on in that same chapter, David's friend Jonathan, who's been trying to protect David as best he can, has to send David away for the protection, his own protection as well as David's. And I understand they never met again. These three major people on whom David had leaned for support were gone. They were with him no more. What does David have left? He has no other support other than himself. He has his self-respect or his pride. But what happened in our text, he loses that also. So here we have the champion of the armies of Israel who had killed Goliath and who had helped defeat the armies of the Philistines turning to or running to the Philistines, the enemies of Israel, in fear of his life. Beloved, whatever plans, whatever goals David may have had are gone. So here he is, again, the once mighty man of Israel going to King Ahish for sanctuary and realizing his mistake. He realizes that the Philistines had not forgotten who he was. They had not forgotten what he had done. So what does he do? He begins to act the fool. He begins to act as a lunatic. Verse 13 says, And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands. So apparently, they had hold to him there, there in the court. He just didn't walk, walk in freely. They, he was escorted in to, uh, to the king's presence. Then it says, and scrabbled on the doors of the gates. 
and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. This man, the future king of Israel, had lost all of his support. He had even lost his own self-respect. His support system had been methodically broken to pieces by the Lord, beginning when God sent an evil spirit upon Saul in chapter 18, verse 10. So David was alone. He's frightened. He's alienated. He could go no lower. He's at the bottom of the pit. So what's happened that God would allow, would do this or would allow this to come upon a man who was after God's own heart? Honestly, I can't tell you. Scripture doesn't say. So a lot of what I'm facing to say is a maybe, and I'll reiterate that. But I want you to... Think about God and his power just a moment as we step away from David. I want to go to the first chapter of the book of Job for just a moment. Job chapter 21, excuse me, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. And this is Job speaking. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Then in verse 22, it's recorded. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. All of Job's supports had been taken away. His wife had even told him, curse God and got and die. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't know the cause of his supports being taken away. Well, you, you and I know today. God used Job as an example to prove to Satan that Job, though he were a sinner, was a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and his stewest evil. And he did prove it. Then again, let's look at Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35. Still looking at the God's power. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? So as we look at David, what could have been the reason for the, his supports being taken away? Well, let's look back. He was brought into Saul's house. He very rapidly rose in prominence. He rose in rank. He rose in popularity among the people. Now, I'm reminding you again, David was still a very young man. And this sudden rise to power and fame may have gone to his head. It may have gone to his head. I can't prove it. And I don't really mean to suggest it, except that I want to use this to go into a direction <coughs> to make a point, and we'll come to it. As David is there with this new support group, he may have forgotten where his first support came from. He may have forgotten to lift up his eyes into the hills from whence his, self, his help had come from in the past. He may have forgotten where he should have been looking rather than looking to the people and things. <coughs> Who is to be looking to? Isaiah 41 and 10 tells us, Fear thou, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. David forgot that. Or may have forgotten that. David was possibly looking to the left and to the right 
for support. And depending, and he was depending on man. And he may have allowed his new importance to keep him from looking toward heaven. And what happened? This new support team. It failed him. It was temporary at best. David should have remembered the words of the Lord to Jacob in Genesis 28 and 15. And God spoke to Abram and or to Jacob and said, Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places, places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again unto this land, for I, have, I, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Now again, this is a might have been idea as to why God either pulled these supports or allowed these supports to be pulled from David. But do you kind of understand where I'm heading? When we, should I say my, me and you or I and you, whichever it is, when we begin to lean on the world rather than on God, he can, and I believe we can look at this example because, it, because I believe it shows us that he will do what it takes to help us learn or, again, to relearn to lean on him alone. For well, the question comes, did David learn to lean solely on the Lord as his life was tempered by these trials and afflictions? Yes, he did. He probably realized it as soon as he left the king's court or Abimelech's court. Because actually he, did, he didn't leave it. I believe he was driven from it. And if we look at Psalm 34, we find David declaring where his support came from and on whom he should have been leaning in and on whom he was now leaning. Now I'm going to read that psalm. I'm going to break it into three sections. And I'm going to speak a little bit on uh, each, each section that I divided into. But I want you to notice, if you, if you look in your Bible and you know, the Psalms uh, have titles to them. And this is the title of, of Psalm 34. It says, A Psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. Now this is a Psalm that David wrote. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his trouble. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him and delivers them. In these seven verses, David has stated a lot of things, but I believe what we're seeing here is that he has learned two, learned two very important things. He's learned to lean on what the Lord has said, whatever praise the Lord might have given him, and not rely on the praise of men. He's also learned to lean on the Lord's protection, learning that God will protect him, not men. Looking at verse 8 of Psalm 34. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye, saint, ye his saints, 
for there is no want to them that fear him. They don't, young, the young lions do not do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of their trouble. Again, I've picked two points out of these two, these verses. And I believe David is telling us that he has learned that the Lord will supply his needs as when he leans upon the open hand of his Savior. And then he's also learned to lean on the Lord's promises. Because the promises of men, they don't amount to much. I can make you a promise here today and I'll be forgot about it. But the promises of God will be fulfilled. And verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. I'm leaning on the Lord's presence, David tells us. I'm leaning on him because the Lord is an ever faithful friend who will always be there. You know, I've been uh, talking, but I haven't mentioned that God never left David. David, God was with David from the time he killed well all of his life. God didn't like some of the things David did, but he was one of, one of God's children. But again, the other thing that David learned here was that he was to lean on the Lord's preservation or the Lord's protection because the priceless eternal truth of God is that God preserves his people. Now I want y'all to know that this pretty much slaps me in the face. When I sit back and I think about all the times that I have leaned upon the world and self, you know, a little bit of self-esteem, rather than leaning upon the Lord, when I look back and I can see how badly some things went. And then I began to see how the Lord was again beginning to teach me that all that I needed was Him. And that He was there. He was my shepherd to supply my needs. Beloved, I want y'all to know that Christ will never fail us or leave us stranded. All of the supports of the world or, or they're nice, but they're temporary. Christ is all of the support system that we will ever need. Now I mentioned it was God's grace that provided David that new environment, that new support system went, in, went into Saul's court. Now this is not saving grace. David had that. Yes, he did. He was one of the elect children of God. But this grace that David see, received was not the eternal saving grace through Christ Jesus. This was 
provisional grace or living grace. This was, or in our case, this is the kindness of God in providing for his people in the ups and the downs of their lives. And we've seen that demonstrated in this message today. And you and I have the wisdom to, by our own experiences, have learned this, know this as well. We've learned it by living. And we have received that living grace in our own lives. Beloved, it was by grace that David rose to prominence. It was by grace that D David was brought low. And it was by this same grace that David learned to lean on God for his strength as he slowly began to climb. He, it wasn't an easy, easy journey as he began to climb because he had much more tribulation before he attained to the kingship of Israel. I want to close with three verses from Psalm 46. I want to share with you verses 1, 10, and 11. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Verse 12, 11, excuse me. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Think on this. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have it, that we can read it, that, that we can understand it, and that you bless us with the understanding of it. Father, today, I pray that we have been taught to rely on you rather than man. Father, you bless us with help from man, Lord, yes. But let our reliance be upon you. And may we forever realize that you are our refuge. You are our strength. And that you are there when we have times of trouble. Help us, O oh Lord, to ever give you the glory, the praise, and the honor for your help, for your grace, for your living grace, and for your saving. And we thank you through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And amen. Our invitational hymn is hymn number 294. If there be any here this morning who the Lord has touched and you want to unite with the First Augusta Primitive Baptist Church, making it your church home and serve the Lord here with this people, we invite you to come.